prior to St. Augustine province. Um, I took my final vows in 2018, after four years of study at Catholic University, and then I went to Rome, and I did three years of coursework at the Gregorian, and uh, then this past fall, I began my first year of the doctorate, which I'm pursuing uh, between Durham University in England and the Antonianum in Rome, and I'm writing on uh, the theology of the Holy Spirit in St. Bonaventure. And what I'm actually going to present today grew originally from a course I took with our brother Bill Henn, who's a professor at the Gregorian, and he taught a course on uh, ecclesiology but from an ecumenical perspective. And so I was in, uh, inspired by his deep love for Christ's prayer that they might be one, and um, it kind of com com compelled me to pursue a similar theme. So I'll just get um, right into it. <clears throat> Pater Sancte, serva eos in nomine tuo, quos te disti mihi, ut sint unum sicut et nos. With these words, the petition of Christ's high priestly prayer becomes in the 22nd chapter of the Regula Non Volata, the petition of Saint Francis himself. They are Christ's words, and they are Francis's words. The theology behind Christ's prayer thus inevitably emerges as part of the very vision of the regula et vita instorum fratrum, of the rule in life of these brothers. In his seminal encyclical on ecumenism, Pope John Paul II interprets the theology of this prayer. He says, Jesus himself, at the hour of his passion, prayed that they may be one, this unity which the Lord has bestowed on his church and in which he wishes to embrace all people is not something added on, but stands at the very heart of Christ's mission. To believe in Christ means to desire unity. To desire unity means to desire the church. To desire the church means to desire the communion of grace which corresponds to the Father's plan from all eternity. Such is the meaning of Christ's prayer, ut unum sint. Might John Paul's comments on Jesus' prayer also apply in some way to Francis, who also prayed them? I think the simple, an simple answer is yes. Francis lived first and foremost from the Lord. It is his vision that Il Poverello seeks to live. And so understanding the depth of the gospel message cannot but continue to shed light on the evangelical mission of the saint from Assisi, a mission which we have continued to pursue. John Paul II's theology of Jesus' prayer has motivated then kind of the writing of this present paper. And so the goal is to unearth an ecumenical challenge implicated by the words ut unum sint within the vision of the earlier rule. Now in order to do this, I'll divide this paper into three sections. So section one is going to turn briefly to the World Council of Churches document, The Church Towards a Common Vision, from 2013. And in this first section, I'll identify certain elements in the text, this text, that then surface in the earlier rule. So in this way, section one prepares for section two, where I turn to the regula non volata and identify those same elements. And so certain key themes in the World Council of Churches document thereby not only appear in, but they also ultimately broaden the very horizons of the earlier rule. Then lastly, section three is a challenge that I will propose to us Franciscans today. But before turning to section one, I want to answer a preliminary question. Why have I chosen this document, The Church Towards a Common Vision? So this document is called a convergence text, and that means that while it does not reach a full con consensus, it shows how far Christian communities have come in their common understanding of the church, and that's taken from the introduction of the text, which is quite significant, because uh, since 1948, when the World Council of Churches kind of officially began, ecclesiology is effectively the biggest obstacle to church unity. So, um, and indeed, the Catholic response, the official Catholic response to this document affirms if the churches agree to the convergences presented in the church towards a common vision, 
a very significant step forward in a continuing process toward visible unity will have been taken. So I've chosen this document because it helps us to see elements in our own vision of life expressed in the earlier rule that can foster the unity for which our Lord himself prayed, ut unum sit. So here we go. Ecclesiological features of the church toward a common vision. The goal of this first section, as I said, is to identify certain points in the document that emerge also in the earlier rule. And I'll identify three, three points. Uh, mission, gospel, and Holy Spirit. So, the church and mission. The document's first chapter is God's mission and the unity of the church. Indeed, mission may very well amount to the interpretive key of the document's understanding of church. The ecclesiology articulated by the document is grounded in mission, and specifically in the mission of God, it says. Here's a quote. The church as the body of Christ acts by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue his life-giving mission in prophetic and compassionate ministry, and so participates in God's work of healing a broken world. Now, this mission naturally exhibits a Christological dimension. After all, the Gospels themselves all conclude with a missionary mandate from Christ, which indicates what he wanted his church to be in order to carry out this mission. Quote, it was to be a community of witness, proclaiming the kingdom which Jesus had first proclaimed, inviting human beings from all nations to saving faith. And so the church has always proclaimed the good news of salvation in Christ. One might say that a missionary impulse lies, uh, drives the church forward as history progresses. And so the document articulates strongly and explicitly that the church, by her very nature, is missionary. Um, and there's a beautiful passage where this is articulated. The mission of the church, and I quote, the mission of the church is fulfilled by its members through the witness of their lives and, when possible, through the open proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. The mission of the church remains that of inviting, through witness and testimony, all men and women to come to know, to come to know and love Christ Jesus. So, um, for the purposes of this presentation, I, I want to point out two aspects of this passage. Um, first, there's two modes of bearing witness. The first mode is witness of one's life, and the second mode involves open proclamation. So, witness and proclamation. The second thing to note is that the mission of the church concerns unity, but it's a universal unity. So it's universal in scope. It aims to draw all people into communion. Let's move now to the church and the gospel. The gospel source of ecclesial life, it's already begun to emerge in light of the comments thus far. And of course, it is the gospel accounts themselves that articulate the missiological constitution of the church. The document affirms the church is centered and grounded in the gospel, the proclamation of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, Son of the Father. The church draws life from the gospel and discovers ever anew the direction for her journey. Accordingly, the document understands the church's living tradition as the way in which the Spirit guides the church in living the gospel historically. So in sum, the point to emphasize here is that the church does not constitute some sort of extra evangelical entity but it's inseparable from gospel life. And now the church and the Holy Spirit. The term spirit or Holy Spirit appears over 70 times in the church towards a common vision. So there's a pneumatological presence that pervades the text. And without getting into a way, all the ways in which the spirit plays a part in the text's ecclesiology, what concerns us is the spirit's role in terms of unity, church unity. So the document states that the Holy Spirit confers manifold gifts upon members and brings forth their unity for the building up of the body. And by the way, this looks very similar to the last chapter of part four of the Revolocquium, when Bonaventure is talking about uh, the Pentecostal mission of Christ. So at Pentecost, the Spirit fills the believers and draws them together in the unity of the Spirit. That's a quote, unity of the Spirit. Jesus sent the Spirit, the text says, to form them into one body. In fact, it was by the guidance of the Spirit that the Gentiles were welcomed into communion. The Holy Spirit, formative of the church, 
thus emerges as the principal protagonist of ecclesial unity. <clears throat> and in the conclusion of the document, the text expresses well this relationship specifically between spirit and unity. It says, our brokenness and division contradict Christ's will for the unity of his disciples and hinder the mission of the church. This is why the restoration of unity among Christians under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is such an urgent task. To be faithful to the guidance of the Holy Spirit involves being faithful to his guidance that propels the church forward towards unity. Where there is the Spirit, there is unity. Before turning to the earlier rule, then, just a brief recapitulation. Um, first, the church is a missional body. The church exists as mission. And this mission, which seeks to touch all people, is rooted in the gospel, which gives life in turn to the church. And this gospel mission of the church is pneumatological. It is driven and guided by the Spirit, who guides the church onward into future glory. And I'll finish with one quote. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent in establishing the kingdom and in guiding the church so that it can be a servant of God's work in the process. Only as we view the present in light of the activity of the Holy Spirit, guiding the whole process of salvation history to its final recapitulation in Christ to the glory of the Father, only then do we begin to grasp something of the mystery of the church. Let's turn now to the earlier rule. The regula non volata, go rebuild my church. <clears throat> As I said, so now this section is going to show how the themes just touched, um, how this offers the possibility in the occasion to discern an ecumenical challenge implicit in the earlier rule, and therefore an ecumenical dimension in the life that we've chosen to live as Friars Minor. <clears throat> First, the regula non volata and mission. In a fine study on the principles of Franciscan mission as articulated in the early sources, Leonard Lehman writes of St. Francis, we find it, that is mission, alluded to throughout all of his writings, which show clearly that his whole life is missionary. He lived a missionary charism. Mission was fundamental to Francis's religious vision and vocation. Accordingly, it should not come as a surprise then that the Regula Nambulata presents, for the very first time in Christian history, a chapter on mission, namely chapter 16, famous. This chapter addresses missionary work specifically among the Saracens and other non-believers. <clears throat> can't offer a thorough reflection on this beautiful chapter, but I want to touch upon three points that are particularly relevant to this discussion here. So the first point, chapter 16 addresses those who want to go inter- non-believers, uh, go among non-believers. Francis uses neither the word ad, which might be more grammatically correct, nor contra, uh, against, which would have been the attitude of the Crusades. The attitude is instead characterized by inter, among them. So Francis renders impossible any interpretation that would imply distancing the friars from others. Indeed, the friars are brothers, and as such, Thoroughly relational. Significantly, Francis also uses the term in his testament, the Lord led me among them. The word thus speaks to the foundational dynamic that grounded Francis' own conversion. Francis chooses this attitude to characterize the activity of his brothers then that follow him. Chapter 16 then eventually commands that all the brothers expose themselves. And so, um, uh, being... Uh, inter means being vulnerable, exposing the self to the other for the sake of the other. The second point, chapter 16 identifies two ways of being inter among the believers, non-believers. One way is that they do not argue or dispute, but rather are subject to every human creature. Another way is that when they see it would please God, they announce the word of God. These two modes reflect the two modes identified above in the church towards a common vision, testimony of life and proclamation. Francis identifies these two ways as modes that the brothers may conduct themselves spiritually inter eos, among them. So with such an explicit missiological constitution, might the earlier rule encourage the brothers 
to be a model of the church's missional existence. Furthermore, to be subject to, to live fraternally in a world of division, is expressive, is expressive itself of Francis's desire for the, for the order as a whole. The third point that I want to make is that similar to the church towards a common vision, the scope of mission in the Regula Non Volata is universal. And to highlight this dimension, I want to look at chapter 23 of the earlier rule, which is a kind of final expression, a culmination of Francis's vision of Minorite life. David Flood identifies the genre here as a law, and it's, a, it's, it's one of praise and invitation. The text praises God and informs, forms an invitation to all to join in the celebration. I won't read the text, but notice all. It's everywhere. All lesser brothers. All ecclesiastical orders, priests, and so forth. All clerics, religious brothers, sisters, all children, youth, etc., etc. The small and great, all peoples, races, tribes, and languages. Francis wants his brothers to be an inviting voice to all, so that all may come to salvation. To echo Layman's fine conclusion, all peoples, and even pagans, are involved in this joyful and penitential liturgy celebrated by the friars in the streets and in the plazas in front of everyone. The universal Laos Dei as the goal of mission. This is the program of chapter 23. The Regula Nambulata in the Gospel. And after the Lord gave to me some brothers, no one showed me what I was to do. Rather, the Most High himself revealed to me that I should live according to the form of the Holy Gospel. This passage of Francis's testament reveals, in the words of Octavian Schmucki, the saint's conclusive clarification of his vocation to gospel life. The earlier rule spells out this gospel life. And so William, William Short, he, he says that the primary source of the rule is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, as the text of the rule will remind us on every single page. A telling story also comes to mind um, for Bonaventure's major legend, when a certain cardinal explains that the Pope, he can't refuse Francis's rule because it would mean refusing the gospel of Jesus. Indeed, the earlier rule is itself grounded in the words of the gospel. The rule and life of these brothers is this, to live in obedience and chastity without anything of one's own, and to follow the footprints and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, and then what follows is a tapestry of Christ's words from the gospel. Such passages as secundum evangelium, right, the Lord says in the gospel, as the Lord says, um, occur frequently, to say the very least, throughout the text. In fact, at times, the regular becomes literally nothing more except a mosaic of gospel passages. Um, and then in a beautiful passage found in chapter 22, I, 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 when I read it, it's like you can hear Francis saying it. Um, Let us hold on to the words, the life, the teaching and his holy gospel, the gospel of Christ. In their joint letter on the anniversary of the rule, um, which came out recently, the general ministers of the order uh, write together, chapter after chapter provides a whole series of guidelines so that the gospel may be lived. Now, I've obviously scratched the surface um, of the significance of the gospel in Francis's vision, but what concerns us at this point is this. The church towards a common vision accentuated the gospel foundation of ecclesial life. The gospel is also the explicit foundation of Francis's vision. So perhaps it could be fruitful to think of the Franciscan charism then, also as a specifically ecclesial charism, one that tries to offer to the world and even to the church herself what the church is always called to be, gospel reality. Would this vision not thus inevitably include an ecumenical component insofar as the church's unity remains incomplete in a broken world? The earlier rule in the spirit. Um, in 1998, the general ministers of the Franciscan family wrote a letter on the role of the Holy Spirit in St. Francis's life, and they said that the, the identity of, they identified the spirit as the real secret which explains the life of Francis. Accentuating this insight, Dominic Monti, uh, he rightly notes, I think, that Francis, uh, that Francis, he never uses the expression imitation of Christ. Imitatio Christi is not in Francis' writings. Rather, the goal lies in following Christ. Uh, Monti writes this, he says, the difference is not just semantic, 
Francis did not so much seek to model himself on an image of Christ out there as to possess the spirit of the Lord Jesus within. The new, this pneumatic secret to Francis's life emerges clearly in the earlier rule. A variety of examples from the text come to mind. One decides to enter into this life because of divine inspiration. The brothers are called to walk spiritualitaire, and instead of being angered by another sin, to help one another spiritually. Through the charity of the Spirit, the, er, the rule asks the brothers to serve and obey one another rather than to speak harm. The desire to go among the Saracens and non-believers must come from divine inspiration. And instead of pride and vainglory, the brothers are to live according to the Spirit of the Lord. So rightfully, then, our general ministers conclude um, in their joint letter of 12, uh, the, the one just came out recently, that they invite us, all the members of the Franciscan family, to join us in commemorating the invitation of St. Francis, clearly expressed in the earlier rule, to live a life guided by the Spirit of God. Significantly, in all of these instances, right here, um, it would not prove a difficult task to see the specifically unitive work of the Spirit at play. After all, it is the Spirit that draws one to enter into the community of the brothers. It is living spiritually that seeks to maintain peace and relationships. It is the Spirit's inspiration that propels one to go on mission. And it is the Spirit who promotes patience and peace, not divisive pride. So, insofar as the vision of Francis involves this pneumatological dimension, it asks the brothers to seek unity. Perhaps Vatican II's Unitatis Radianti Grazio can shed light on this spiritual vocation the brothers have vowed to live. It is the Holy Spirit, the document states, dwelling in those who believe and pervading and ruling over the church as a whole, who brings about that wonderful communion of the faithful. He brings them into intimate union with Christ, so that he is the principle of the church's union. A challenge to Franciscans today. What might this reflection mean thus far for us? An, obviously challenge, an obvious challenge concerns the ongoing task of ecumenism, ut unum sint. And this is no easy task. The desire for unity does not affect unity necessarily. But I would like to echo here uh, encouraging words from Joseph Ratzinger. It's a very concise statement, but it's very insightful. He says, even as separated brethren, we can be one. When we're in, in some sense an example of this right here. Even as separated brethren, we can be one. So I think as lesser brothers, we would do well to take these words seriously. In fact, precisely as brothers, we've responded to a call, guided by the Spirit of the Lord, to accept a relational mode of being in this broken world. This mode of being could serve well the challenge of ecumenism itself of seeking, promoting, and fostering living unity in the midst of division. The themes explored by this paper, mission, gospel, spirit, certainly suggest as much. Yet at this point, another challenge emerges, brothers. How can we seek unity at the ecumenical level if there remains disunity among the brothers themselves? While Francis addresses brothers who desire to go inter non-believers, I wonder if we today are fearful of going inter another province. Do provinces separate us or unite us? <clears throat> Beyond the provincial level, what of the three major branches of this order? The OFMs, the Conventuals, and the Capuchins. Can we really take the challenge enfolded in the words ut unum sint seriously if we ourselves portray more division than fraternal community? In a word, unity propels unity. So if there is disunity inter nos, it most certainly will inhibit greater ecclesial unity. So the challenge to pursue ecumenical work entails the concurrent challenge to pursue interprovincial and ultimately interobediential unity. Ut, if I may, sumus unum. Conclusion. Um, initially inspired by John Paul II's reflection on the words of Christ, ut unum sent, and then by ecclesiological elements in the church towards a common vision, this paper has ultimately formulated an ecumenical challenge directed to us lesser brothers of St. Francis. After identifying in the church towards a common vision three dimensions regarding ecclesial life, mission, gospel, and spirit, this paper then proceeded to identify those same dimensions in the earlier rule. And doing so led to a reading of the text of the rule that involved an ecumenical component. Guided by the Regula Non Volata, then, we friars have an opportunity 
to enflesh certain ecclesiological dimensions that would manifest a very significant step forward in a continuing process toward visible unity, as the Catholic response to this document stated. So while it's not an explicit concern of the 13th century state saint, I don't think ecumenism is by any means peripheral to his vision. In other words, the themes of mission, gospel, and spirit endow the earlier rule with an implicit ecumenical challenge. In the end, this challenge brought to light a further challenge, to work for Franciscan unity, ut sumus uno. In this way, Francis's brotherhood will be more and more equipped to respond to the brokenness and division that contradicts Christ's will for unity, that plagues our world, by concretely instantiating anew the regula et vita istorum fratrum, the rule in life of these brothers. Thank you. Questions? You made mention of uh, imitation, you know, Dominic Monti's point. I'm just curious, one, actually one, uh, I don't remember who said this at some point during, you know, formation, said something to the effect of making things be footprints and footsteps, so like we follow the footprints of Christ, is something closer to imitation? I'm just, I mean, maybe, maybe that's not, uh, maybe this is more for discussion later, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on, on something like that. Um, yeah, I, I, so I think at least from, from Monty's perspective, yeah. he was concerned that if, if we, um, it's not just semantics in the sense of imitation might just be like a parrot, right. you know, and we're just doing what this man did 2,000 years ago, and all of a sudden it looks kind of weird. But following in the footprints, it could be seen as a more, um, in some ways, a more intentional, because mm -hmm. you have to go where he's leading you. Uh, and it's more personal, I think, even mm -hmm. in that sense. You're not just a parrot, but you're following him um, in intentionally, so to speak. Um, and uh, so I think the, the <laughs> emphasis on footprints, um, I think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I certainly think it's worth talking about more, especially because imitation of Christ is used so widely today. Sure. And, and, and I certainly don't want to uh, downplay the richness of that spirituality. Right, right. But I think Monty's paper did a good job of highlighting textually what's going on in Francis's vision and uh, the, the simple nu the, the, the nuance that comes with following Christ instead of just imitating, mm -hmm. imitating Christ. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Are we into the general discussion? Yeah, sure. Let's go. So, When you talk about uh, uh, atonement, um, are you thinking more practically, uh, gospel, living the gospel, working with one another, or are you talking more about canonically or jurisdictionally? So, a kind of, especially among the three families. Yeah. So, um, I think it's great that, like, uh, that, that, that people have talked about um, the unification of the first order. I, I don't see it happening at any time soon. And I, I, I mentioned this morning, in Rome, uh, they're trying to unify the three Franciscan uh, academic centers into one university, and that's like impossible. <laughs> so uh, if they can't do one university, one first order, uh, it's not gonna happen, okay? So, um, but, but we can certainly collaborate together more. And I think that in that way, we can uh, strengthen the gravitas of the Franciscan voice in the church, which I think is a, a special voice. Um, and certainly the tradition uh, that began with St. Francis has witnessed to that. And so uh, I think jurisdictionally and canonically, I mean, if we wanna to work towards certain uh, aspects of that, I think that's good, um, but I think more pressing and, and perhaps even more enriching is finding ways to uh, work more with, with one another. Um, I'm living right now in an OFM house in Rome at St. Isidore's, and that's been extremely formative, and it's opened new relationships and new connections, and uh, it's been a formative experience for me. Um, and I think those ways can, can strengthen the, the, Franciscan, the Franciscan voice. Yeah, working 
more together and learning from one another. And, and that makes the most sense to me too. Yeah. It seems like if we look at the economic and the fiction, we have to confront the, the historical fact that the Holy Spirit was moving in divisions because they were church approved divisions. And uh, maybe that's not the best way to go. Maybe but, collaboration. By that same token, what's the goal? What's the goal? To remain in what the Holy Spirit did 500 years ago, or to remain in the Holy Spirit? Maybe we'll put this back together. Yeah. Yeah. What spirit moving today? Yeah. yeah. Well, wasn't the point of the? I mean, the point of the divisions in the first place was unity. I think. I mean, ultimately, it was to bring everybody to Christ, and and kind of realizing that this. Okay, we need to we need to split off here because this is going to allow us to more closely follow Christ in the way, right? Like I don't know, like is, what I I would hate to say at some point that you know there's a spirit of division, but it was like a a bad thing. I I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm thinking, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, it was all in the spirit, so it's all it's all good. But like, yeah, was it? Yeah, I, I don't know what I'm thinking there. Sorry. What <laughs> friend? I'm sorry. I have a phenomenological question um, because because I teach theology, I listen to people's language and it raises all kinds of questions and it has to do with both of your talks. <clears throat> and this is not probably going to be we're not going to solve this today, but it's just something for consideration. Um, and and to to lead us into that question, here's an example. I was sitting at a table one time in New York City across from my guardian uh, when I was working on my doctorate. And he was upset about some of the friars in the house. I know it's unusual that, <laughs> that people got something. And he looked at me and said, Why? it's like they haven't even read the Gospels. Well, having been in the midst of studies and my intellectual way of framing everything, I said, Ange, what do you mean by the Gospels? And he looked at me like, have you ever read the Gospels? <laughs> I said, I said I, that's a serious question. What do you mean by the Gospels? And, and once he was convinced I was asking that seriously, he goes, why would you ask? So I said, well, if you'd ever met my mom, who's a fundamentalist, she'd tell you one thing. If you, and if you tell me one thing, you, you will not be in the same ballpark of what the Gospel is. And I, a lot of times we use, we use language as though we think the other person is understanding it the way we're expressing it. And um, so but when, when you were using about formation and different mindsets that come in, this different phenomenological way of understanding life, I think one of the things is we take for granted we understand each other by using common words with completely different phenomenological horizons of understanding. So. To me, I think one of the discussions we have to have amongst ecumenism, but also amongst the three orders, is what the hell do we mean by these things? Because I, I, I dare say that we have different different interpretations of these things, and that's why the, there's difficulty. I, I, I just to respond real quick because I think that's a that's a that's a super good point. I, just, I think it's also accurate. Uh, certainly a fundamentalist Christian is going to have a different understanding of the gospel. And then even maybe in this room, uh, when we say gospel to one another, we might have, have different interpretations. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting that in the World Council of Churches document, uh, the World Council of Churches was founded in 1948, and they were only able to write a document on the church um, in 2013. So it almost took like that long to... Uh, even begin talking about the church because everyone had radically different notions of what church is. And so um, I think having those these kinds of conversations aren't easy in the sense that they're really, they, they can be very complicated and complex and they can take a really long time. Um, but I think it's important to have them. Paul, do you want to go first? I can sit down. I feel we're the only one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My question was uh, along the lines of rebuild my church. 
And one of the things that I've been hearing uh, a lot in uh, some of the writings that are coming out now is the notion of missionary disciples. And rebuilding my church is basically uh, revitalizing the church in the sense of um, bringing back people who have drifted away and trying to to make the church's message one that has importance in their life, one which makes a difference as to how they live. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, I don't think that's what you were talking about <laughs> uh, when you said rebuild my church. It's more an ecumenical type of, of uh, movement. But as I say, this is one of the things that I've been hearing about uh, at least in the diocese where I'm uh, living, that rebuilding the church from within as far as uh, reaching out to people who are, uh, have become disenfranchised or who have disenfranchised themselves. Any comments? Uh, the, so I, 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 I chose just that one section to, to name, re, go rebuild my church. Um, I think that I think that experience is a key experience for St. Francis, and uh, the reason why I did that there is because the living the gospel is always go, is rebuilding the church, and I think um, I mean my personal take I, I think Francis envisioned an order that could in fact kind of show to the church what the church is always called to be in any given time, but perhaps might be failing at that moment. So always kind of. Um, pushing the church back to the Gospels um, in, in, a, in, a, in a challenging and robust way. So that's what I had by Go Rebuild My Church. But I think like missionary disciples is, an, is in fact a really uh, significant step, especially in a culture that's becoming more and more secular, mm -hmm. um, to reach out. I mean, uh, you might have a, a similar... Yeah, I, I was thinking of it, and, um, and then going back to that, that thing that I referenced in the earlier rule about, uh, you know, observing and uh, the... the behavior of the, of the minister and servant. Um, and I think that uh, it also gets to your point in terms of like what, like when we get in clarifying terms. People followed Christ um, not necessarily because of anything he said, but because of who he was and how he behaved. Um, you know, and I think people join Francis not because of what he was preaching, but because of who he was, the charismatic nature of those personalities. And so I think in terms of like when you're talking about missionary disciples and doing things, it really is, I think, simply walking the walk. And then and then the semantics, semantics is too facile, I don't mean I'm not giving a better word. The semantics don't matter because, you know, like, well, I don't know what you mean when you say formation, but I like what you're doing. You know, like that, that you, you look like somebody worth following, like being with and praying with. And I think this is the same sort of thing. Like when you talk about people who've left the church, um, I don't think the question really should be why did they leave the church. I think the question there should always be why do we stay. And if we can answer that for ourselves, why we stay, and then live that, and hopefully the answer is not just because I got nowhere else to go. Right, <laughs> which may be true, <laughs> but hopefully it's a deeper answer than that. And we live that, then eventually they're going to ask, "You're an idiot. Why do you stay?" And 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 enter into that conversation. I think people get confused today about um, their own goodness and and saying, "I'm a do-gooder. I don't even need to go to church." Yeah, right. Rather than putting God first and saying it's because of God's goodness, not mine, you know, and and it's all because of right. what He's doing. And we also look at in terms of the order. Francis, when he died, he said, "I've done what was mine to do. May God teach me mm -hmm. yours." And so, because it's, it's so open, there's many branches on the tree of the order, and so we have life springing up all over the place in trying to be attentive to the spirit which enlivened the church through Francis's 
response when all the friars come in and all the order growing, growing into an order, just through his, his response to the spirit. But then again, the, the spirit is moving us forward now. And, and our, our goal and task is to remain unified in, not, uh, in, in the truth of our faith. And that John Paul warned that we shouldn't, and, and with one in sin, uh, to not stray too far from uh, the truth of our faith in being ecumenical. There was a danger there. That we had to remain unified in the spirit, and the cross was the key that he that he spoke about in, in that in that doctrine. So, yes, ecumenism is very important, but to remain true to the gospel is is key in the spirit's movement. Uh, it does strike me that. Culturally, the challenge of many uh, younger vocations <clears throat> has been uh, more divisive, uh, in the sense that their identity is is at stake in a kind of apologetics, an aggressive apologetics, or my friends don't do this, and I'm different. I mean, countercultural, mm -hmm. and so I'm departing from that. And there's a a sense in which the engagement is sometimes based on almost a confrontational uh, encounter. Uh, I, I thought the, the quotes that you were mentioning about, you know, don't go out there and correct them, don't go out and fix them. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I worked with the Missionaries of Charity, they were talking about working with transgender people. And I said, well, what, what, do you, what would you recommend to, to, to say? To, and they said, well, the, the, the sister said, Oh, well, our first premise is very simple. We go out there and we love them. And she said, we don't have a lot more as a second step. <laughs> all worked out. But the first step, she said, very sure. So we go out, we love them. So it was a very non-confrontational. And I contrast it with some of the students I teach. I work at a diocese and seminary and say, um, the culture says uh, we confront, uh, we, we uh, challenge, we attack. <laughs> we, you know, it's, it, there's a, there's a, a little bit of a, a, a change in there. So I thought what, what you were saying in terms of the ecumenical vision is very countercultural for maybe even some of our younger uh, people that are young, that attracted to, to activity in the church. Is, I think it goes in right, the, it's like the the difference between inter and contra. Yes, exactly. Francis it's do not want, yes. he didn't want us to go contrary to them, contra them, yeah. um, but to be into them, uh, inter them. I think among the contra is not just in Nicaragua. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> to, to that point, I think, you know, again, the Francis wrote a fair bit, you know, and I'm sure he spoke even more, you know, but it, it's, that's not what made the difference, right? It was, it was his life. It's the way that he lived that inspired. And it's, uh, I mean, the rule itself is short and I mean, the later rule, the approved rule is super short and uh, yeah, not, not all that inspirational when I read it all the time, right? But the man, right? The way that he lived. And I think that's the same way with Christ, right? Like the gospels are pretty short. You know, I mean, amazing, miraculous things happen, yet it's, there's something about the man that is uh, inspirational. I think that's that missionary disciple drive is get away from trying to think that we need to convince people with words or uh, awesome arguments and, and live it in such a way that it shows I'm convinced. It shows uh, what it is that we believe, uh, sort of following in that, you know, St. James, you know, Show me, show me, show me your faith by your works, right? So let, let the works speak and um, uh, for themselves. But yeah, I really like that, and I, and going, I mean, I so uh, also to the to the point that that uh, Kyle had made about the idea of different differing concepts, you know, around language and things. I do, I do agree with this very much. But I think for us as as Catholics or Christians generally, we have to start with the point that that that. 
some sort of unity and concept is possible through the spirit, right? So not only that we can be one, like in Christ, because, you know, whatever, but like all of the work that we're doing, right? There, there's, it's possible to be unified in, con in, in thought, you know, to be one in word and deed and also, but also in thought, right? That we're able to sort of, um, that, this, that there's some way that uh, we can have, right? Because I think like some of the flop more, recent philosophers, many of whom I like, but uh, they'll say that there's something like almost an impossibility or near impossibility to ever really share a concept or a thought because we'll always have these different foundational experiences or principles or whatever. But I just I think we have to start with the fact that it's possible in the spirit, right? It's possible in... Uh, you know, I think, that, I think that's, our, that's our superpower. Um, really, I think... Yeah. Franciscans in general, like if we don't, maybe we can't articulate it, but we don't need to. If, like if you ask, ask people that are, are parishioners of Franciscan parishes, right. or even they're not, but they come in once in a while, like what's different about the Franciscan parish? And nobody can really say exactly what, I mean, because they get, they got RCIA, and they got a Bible, summer Bible camp, and they got right. all this, but there's something different about that parish. And I think that's true with us. And, and I think it's because the, the, the witness that we make, right. and um, even if it's unconscious, I, I think we're good at it in general. I think Pope Francis warns against a kind of unity that we have to watch out for. Um, that commercialization also tries to make the world one by being mm -hmm. homogeneous. Right, right, relatively. So there's a unity of homogeneity that is a real danger and could become a danger for Franciscan life as well. And so I think there's another kind of unity that we're really talking about, which may be the unity of complementarity. We can complement one another. I think that's true, and I kind of made your point about where the spirit is, because um, is that the last one I talked about, fear? <laughs> Lost track where we are, but I, I, I we had this kind of conversation in the last one, and we talked about. I, I made a mention of like, if you put a bunch of prize room tech or habits off, oh, put yeah. a beer in our hand, you can't tell the difference between <laughs> a cap and a conventional one and all of that, right? They're we're basically the same, but but maybe we should, and so maybe part of this talk of unification might mm -hmm. renew, like, well, what, well, why were the caps formed in the first place? What was the gift you brought? And do you still have it? And if you don't, then maybe you should just, we just should all just join up. But if, but if you don't, and maybe you think you want to renew it, then maybe that's a witness to the church that the church can use. And so maybe, maybe that's a result of the, of the thing, you know. What makes us unique as conventuals? What are, how are we different? Um, and you can do that. I think you could bring, I think, those are not necessarily diametrically opposed because you can bring, in, in our constitutions, I think it's the constitutions, we t there's this talk of patrimony. <laughs> Remember like the, the East Coast Provincial James sent out this thing, we, we need to make a list of all our patrimony. So one of the priests in our house, like, oh, we have this good chalice and that good chalice and this, but the, the, the where I read this, and I wanna say it's the constitution, uh, made very clear that, that when we use the word patrimony, we're talking about those things without which we could not do our mission, which are so uh, tied to our identity. And I hope to God that's not just a stained glass window. <laughs> right? You know? So I think we could unify and then identify those things that are uniquely ours to enrich a large, uh, some other kind of a new group. But it also means maybe we can't, but, and those things are of value and we need to say something. This is a question about ecumenism as it applies to the, um, not so much inter-Franciscan ecumenism, but more to um, inter-Christian ecumenism in the North, specifically, especially in the North American context, it's a question. Is, could it be said that there's a new form of ecumenism emerging, perhaps through enculturation, uh, as witnessed 
in, especially among uh, young Catholics, not exclusively, but especially among young Catholics in North America, um, in two instances. A smaller instance, it's less common, but it, it's increasingly common, is the openness of Western, of Roman Catholics to uh, Eastern Christianity. But more common is um, the phenomenon of praise and worship nights, in which there's something distinctly what Roman Catholic is adoration paired with music that originated in evangelical Protestantism and oftentimes with charismatic forms that originated in Pentecostalism, which is one of the most widespread forms, I'm sure everyone's seen it, among young Catholics. Is that a form of ecumenism? Um, in that, I mean, it's not, it's certainly something that's distinctly Catholic in a certain sense, but is, is that enculturation a sign of ecumenism in, in, in your vision, and is it something that Franciscans should be emphasizing in that or not? Uh, what's, the, what's that PC term we use, like, when you take something from another culture and you use cultural it? Appropriation. Cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation, or is it cultural appropriation? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say, um, uh, my, my gut reaction, I think that is a form of ecumenism. I mean, you're not, um, uh, you're, you're going among the other, and um, you know, you're bringing with them um, what the Lord has given you, and, and your faith, and uh, you're, you're bearing witness to it. Even if, even if uh, you're, you're not preaching it, you're bearing witness to it, right? By witness or by proclamation. And I think that is a form of ecumenism. I think establishing relations is always about unity. <clears throat> Uh, relations aren't about uh, uh, separating the other, but it's about deeper communion. And so I think uh, the more that we do establish relations, uh, the more that we are fostering a kind of unity. So I think like one of the great aspects of a symposium like this is establishing gr greater relationships um, between different provinces and the, between the three branches, um, because I think re relations foster unity. Yeah, I think that the reaching out to the other has to be the piece. If we are just taking it, I mean, it is to a certain extent in terms of the, that we are recognizing this coming out of the evangelical tradition, which formerly we would have rejected out of hand just because it's evangelical, we are recognizing is a good. Like, no, this is a way to connect with God. So there, that is good, but I think it's not ecumenical until you invite and the relationship happens. I would see it more as uh, Ricci's enculturation of what was good among Confucians. Uh, of what? Uh, the enculturation of Ricci in the, among the Chinese. Okay. You know, he, he saw there was good in their practices, and then he enculturated it himself into that. And it was a positive. It actually had a positive effect. Um, and I think that's probably, yeah. I, mean, I think we rail against the culture a lot. Use the word secularism, secularism, so often it's we don't see the good in in there, and um, and the thing is, is you're not I, at least here at Saint Bonaventure, I haven't converted any of them. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my way of Catholicism. I don't like. I grew up Pentecostal. I can't stand the music anymore. <laughs> but, but if they like it and that draws them, I have to be open to that. So. Ready break. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah, thank you, you very much.